good afternoon is a gentle way of saying sit down and be quiet. <laughs> what? There you go. Thank you for that class of one. David Nidorf being uh, unable to uh, be here, <laughs> I'm going to deliver the lecture. Uh, lock the doors! <laughs> uh, if you did not get my little flyer here about uh, astronomical memorial to Brother Raphael Patton and uh, uh, Raphael Pollock, I'm going to make some more of them and hand them out at the barbecue. It has uh, this cute little front and then it has information on the back and it encourages you to send in uh, stories about these two fine tutors and send large checks to me. <laughs> Almost. Thank you very much. Well done. One other small piece of business. Our IAC secretary is holding up an orange piece of paper. For those of you who are graduates and have not supplied your present and active email address to the program, here's your chance to make amends. This thing will be circulating surreptitiously throughout the afternoon. And you do not have to be an alumni necessarily to receive the email. All right, so take money from any. If you would like to receive it, <laughs> <laughs> please feel free. <laughs> so somehow, reminiscence has become a theme of the afternoon, so I shall introduce our speaker with a couple reminiscences. David Nydorf is sometime tutor of the integral program of liberal arts. Those of you who were students during his tenure will necessarily remember him fondly. Those of you who are present students should know that he is responsible for the unique integral tradition of the intramural cinema, when sophomores, freshmen, juniors, and seniors are mixed together to do readings that they otherwise might not do. To the astonishment of the long-serving tutors, this has actually become profitable, both for tutors and for students. So thank you, David. He has also served as many of you know, as president of Deep Springs College, and was, among other things, while here at St. Mary's, the recipient of the O. De Sales Perez Award for Outstanding Services to the Collegiate Seminar. So he, his uh, esteem traveled on beyond the program, with probably good reason. So without any further ado, I give you our speaker, David Knight. Thank you guys for coming out here. I'm, uh, I'm going to assume that you can hear me, and if you can't, you should wave at me, because um, it's hard to tell sometimes with these things. And, and I, I want to say, I, I want to thank those folks who invited me here to, to speak. I, I really do appreciate it. It's lovely to be back here. And I do remember the last time I spoke at one of these Brother Robert lectures, it was 2008. I, I know that no one here remembers what I talked about because you invited me back, but, but I remember it. And in thinking about you know, the charity of this program, this institution, and inviting me back here, I, I, uh, I realize that either you, the, the, the faculty of the Integral Program, the ones who I've worked with who still know me, have cultivated an extreme degree of, of uh, mercy <laughs> and forgiveness, or else, and this is equally likely, they're, they're, they're aging in their memories. <laughs> um, and I, I just I want to take whichever of those two forces is responsible for my presence. Um, I also want to note that Brother Robert, whom I only knew a little bit, always had a glint in his eye as if there was a stand-up comedy routine running in the back of his head commenting sarcastically on everything that was going on in a very dignified room. And I was thinking about that when I realized I was going to speak after lunch at 2 p.m. <laughs> um, that's kind of a crazy assignment. I hope I can keep you awake. Um, 
do my best. <laughs> and I do want to. I do want to thank in particular the people who invited me out here and who were involved with helping me come, David and Julia and, and Steve and, and, and Gabe in particular. Thank you for the, for the invitation. Um, you you might have guessed from my title if you read. Oh, let me ask you one other thing. How many people, when you were a freshman in the integral program, actually read all of the Odyssey? <laughs> Okay, that's not too bad. That's not too bad. I want to warn you that I'm going to assume that you did. Um, and, and, uh, you know, and then I'm going to depart from the usual format of a, of a, of a formal lecture in which you assume nothing about what people already know. And, and you might have guessed from my title that I want to talk about Homer. I want to talk about Homer in a way that's, that's connected to contemporary life. And I, I think that that's that's proper. I mean, Homer in particular has always seemed to me to be about contemporary life. And I also think that, that that's the only legitimate excuse for liberal education, is that it should shine on and enrich you know, the present of our lives. But I also think that we need to like read authors like Homer if we want them to do that, you know, with as little theory as possible and pretty much, you know, pretty straight in terms of the way they wrote. And those aren't really opposed views. Um, they're the, way, they're the way books work, right? They're, there's old time enchantments and those, those about, you know, if you think of Odysseus' travels compared with his account of his Cretan travel that you, that you recently read in book 14, those are, those are uh, um, those all go together, I think. Um, that's what makes it fun to read them. So I'm, I'm, I'm also, let me warn you, I'm, I'm gonna sketch an argument. I also realized as I was preparing for this talk why it is that I spent my entire life avoiding giving talks about Homer. And the reason is because uh, it's such a dense poem that to make a textual argument for any claim you want, you'd have to write something longer than the Homeric poems. <laughs> um, and I was tempted to, to do that until I became exhausted and, and realized that it was, I was going to be speaking at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So, so I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do that at something I think is more appropriate to the interval program, which is, you know, try to start a conversation. And I do hope that we can that we can have one. Um, <clears throat> but I, I'll, I'll tell you what what argument I'm, I'm going to aim at, and ideally make a little bit interesting. But I certainly can't can't nail it down in analytic terms. Um, I'm going to try to note that in the beginning of the of the Odyssey, as many of you will remember, Zeus is complaining to the rest of the gods about how human beings are always blaming the gods for the bad stuff that happens to them, when in fact a lot of it is their own damn fault. Um, he says a lot of it is beyond fate. In other formulations, he says beyond what's necessary. Um, but people blame Zeus anyway. And I think if we look to try to find out what he means by that and what makes that claim plausible in the Odyssey, we'll see something about the character of human life which suggests at the same time that we, in contemporary times, should blame the gods a little bit more and take a little less responsibility ourselves for all the bad stuff that happens to us. And I want to, I, I, you know, and to see each other, I think, is a little more helpless and pitiful than we, than we normally do. And it seems to me that what stands in the way, both in Homer and for us, of, of taking that moderate view is a lack of courage. Um, you now, why would that matter to anybody, I think is a legitimate question. And if you, if you take just the extremes, right, and I, don't, I, I know people don't live on the extremes, but they're easier to think about to clarify what's at stake in the, in the means. And if you just take the extremes, the question of, of what and to what extent are you responsible for is important because blaming all your, your suffering on the plan of Zeus, on the oppressive power of the will of Zeus, uh, makes a person or it makes a people passive, too passive, too willing to live with suffering or evil, too willing to sub be subordinate to, to authority, to you know, confuse social standing with natural authority, and it makes people too fearful. And especially fearful, there's a secret, all fear, about the future. All fear is about the future. Um, and the opposite stance, where you take entire responsibility as human beings for the quality of your life, for social progress, for emanatizing the eschaton, if you wish, 
for, for uh, you know, setting up risk management committees and, to, and minimizing suffering. That too, although it's very often good, when you, when you take all the agency away from Zeus and put it all onto human beings, what you end up with is, again, a kind of fearful existence, I think. A similar one. But when you blame, you know, universities, school systems, national, international, corporate, religious, legal, biopolitical bio regimes for what's wrong around you, you end up getting frustrated and resentful and suspicious, and you start demonizing people. And I think it's, it's more or less a fearful stance to take. So the common terms of both of these, both halves of this false dichotomy, is, is fear. And, and uh, courage, on the other hand, is of, of a mean and it's for a mean. So let me, let me look a, a little bit at those two terms in my title, risk and blame. I say risk because fear and danger, the more natural terms have collapsed, I think, into a more modern, more calculable term. It's a risk. We don't have fear and danger committees. We have risk committees. We have risk calculations. Risk is a, is a, is a modern term for danger, and it hides a new way of thinking about it, which is that you can calculate it. When you quantify or calculate future danger, it turns into risk. Danger is everywhere in all lives, as you know. But when it's called risk, only when there's a background and understanding that you should employ rational terms of analysis, foresight, and restraint, so as to predict those dangers, minimize those dangers, balance those dangers. Instead of fear and hope, we have risk-reward ratios, and we blame people who ignore those ratios. In this background and understanding, we blame irresponsible people who risk their family's stability instead of commiserating with them about the tragedies that they endure. We assume that responsible institutions have risk committees that work to predict and minimize dangers, to create safety and safe spaces to avoid damage to people, usually through rules and other regimes of, of various kinds of social restraints. And there's no doubt that a lot of things get a lot better with this approach, and I do not mean to imply that it doesn't belong in the world. But when risk analysis fails and bad things happen, we can tell a lot about how we think about the world by how we assign blame. It's not long ago that accident insurance policies had rioters that excluded loss resulting from war or from acts of God. That was a legal term, a category for supposedly unforeseeable yet over time inevitable disasters like fires, floods, earthquakes. Today that category has disappeared largely, and what replaces it is, is legal documents where you consent in an insurance policy to the valuation or assumption or more usually the exclusion of risks. There are, in a sense, no acts of God in this way of thinking about things. If something bad happens, and yet I think you can see this in your own life, in the texture of your own life, if something bad happens, somebody must be responsible, some institution must be assigned some share of the blame, at the very least for not having foreseen it, more likely for not having taken the action to forestall it. In Homeric, in Homeric terms, sorry, bad things happen when people neglect their sacrifices. In modern terms, we have that strange mythical force that we have to sacrifice to, one that everybody speaks about and nobody I've yet heard define coherently. It's this, it's the thought of accountability. Um, so in the opening lines of the Iliad, as many of you may remember, the poet asked the muse to sing the song for the anger of Achilles which put pains thousandfold upon the Achaeans and hurled in their multitudes to the house of Hades strong souls of heroes, but gave they themselves to be the delicate feasting of dogs, of all birds, and the will of Zeus was accomplished. So think about the situation. Agamemnon had stirred up Achilles' anger, or we might now say he had neglected, you know, consultants on the best practices for work group collaboration, <laughs> and he failed to make the assembly a place where everyone felt legitimately needed to speak and everyone felt, felt understood and supported. And that diminished the army's productivity when it came to sacking and pillaging. Um, or you could say he misunderestimated the risk of calling Achilles out on his violation of group norms. 
<laughs> and Achilles forgot his duty to practice an aesthetics of care for the entire group, not just himself or the Myrmidons. And instead, he acted out in a fit of toxic masculinity, which, well, yeah, it does make for a good story. For most of its stakeholders, the result was really kind of a bummer. <laughs> so where's the Homeric blame there? This passage in the Iliad ends with the line, and the will of Zeus was accomplished. Well, okay, if it's Zeus's will or wish, does that mean he's to blame? Is he accountable for it? More generally, when we notice, as we must, that human life is filled with a multitude of dangers and a thousandfold pains, that whatever our tribe, we still eat by the sweat of our brow, bring forth children in pain, suffer the dominion of others as slaves, subjects, employees, democratic citizens, or if I follow Genesis, as wives. And then at the end of all, the end of that, all that comes of it in this world, in any way, is dust. Is God to blame for that plan? Or, to take the alternative view, sticking with these inevitable false dichotomies, if it's not God, maybe it's all our fault. All the bad things that happen to us, it's all our fault. For some real or imaginary or personal or structural or historical or original sin. But note that the Iliad's evocation doesn't exactly say that what happens is through Zeus's fault. But that is a very common interpretation of the passage, and I'll bet most of you in freshman seminars spent time talking about whether or not in Homer the human beings are just puppets of the gods. You're tempted to think about it that way. You're tempted to assign all the agency to the gods. But the poem complicates that very, very greatly without ever resolving it decisively. <coughs> Compare that to the first speech of the Odyssey, just after the opening, where Zeus expresses frustration to all the other gods about, I guess, the state of his all-powerful reputation. He says, look, look, tells them to look at how all these mortals put the blame on us gods when it's they, by their own recklessness, who win sorrow beyond what is given. His particular complaint, familiar to most people from seminars, I think, is that people just don't listen. <laughs> Hermes had warned Aegisthus not to marry Clytemnestra and murder Agamemnon, and he even explained to him why not. He said that time would pass, generations would change, Orestes would grow up, and then Aegisthus was going to get murdered in turn. Note, please, that there are two ways here of describing Aegisthus' error. One is, he was not open to persuasion. He thought he knew what, was, what the right thing to do was. He knew what he wanted to do, but that's easy to know. He also thought he knew it was right, or that he could get away with it. He was not open to persuasion. And the second error he makes is a denial, essentially, of fate in one of its, in one of its sizes, namely time. The fact, human fact, human fate of being better in time, in growth, and change. So he forgot, he forgot to think about how time passing, and generations of change was going to lead to disaster. And it looks like now Zeus is annoyed because he's taking a lot of heat for this tragedy. I think what's happening probably is that the rate of sacrifice is dropping off. <laughs> and, and Poseidon's having to go all the way to Ethiopia to get her offerings. Um, and, and I think, I, that's the suggestion anyway in Book 24 by Laertes. Laertes says when it Odysseus tells him that all the suitors are dead. He says, and I'll quote, Father Zeus, there are gods indeed on tall Olympus if truly the suitors have had to pay for their recklessness. That means that Laertes, kind of like Odysseus, kind of like Penelope, and turns out kind of like Telemachus, hear prophecies and hear stories about the gods as propositions to be tested. It's a hypothetical. Are there really gods? Well, we'll see if there's any justice or not. If they had gotten away with it, then he probably would have concluded that the gods were the kind of thing that we generally tend to treat them as, which is uh, children's tales. And all the way through the Odyssey, there's characters who attribute and misattribute their suffering to Zeus. 
in part it's a verbal formula, it's a shrug, you know, oh, woe is me, you know, Zeus's will is that, you know, I failed this exam today. Um, and, and uh, you know, I think it's, it's easy to, to think in everyday life of all sorts of references to God's inscrutable plan. Um, in Book 24, the shade of Agamemnon says himself, in, in what Book 1 shows us is just self-deluded ignorance, he says about his death, quote, In my homecoming, Zeus devised my dismal destruction to be killed by the hands of my cursed wife. And just, and it's interesting there, I think, that, that first of all, he attributes everything to Zeus, that Zeus is just in the beginning of the book, said, man, I wish they wouldn't blame this all on us. <laughs> on the other hand, he blames most of it on Clytemnestra, and only as an afterthought on Odysseus. And I think that's, that's also, I won't speak very much about that, but this is a theme in here, that, that if you don't want to offend Zeus by blaming things upon him, the technique that most of these pompous speakers in Homer and, and in Homer adopt is they blame women instead. You may have did it in the part that you guys read, you know, where he said, you know, I've been slaved by a woman, and I, you know, curse on all women for this reason. This he says two lines after the fact, he said, I wish I had a wife. Um, <laughs> And Aristophanes makes a joke about, about not about Eumaeus, but in general, in Lysistrata, there's a passage where, where one woman says to another, you know, if these guys really think there's so much trouble, how come they keep wanting to marry us? <laughs> so, throughout the Odyssey, uh, I've got to find my place again here. Um, uh, just one other example from Book 24, which is the dead suitor in Phimidon, who Agamemnon queries about why could so many young suitors get killed at the same time. And he says, oh, it's because of the purpose of Aegis bearing Zeus. Aegis bearing Zeus is to blame, he says, because he stirred murder into the mind of Odysseus. Odysseus didn't think of it himself. Zeus put it there. And just in case we miss how deluded he is, he then goes on and says, and besides Odysseus put into the mind of Penelope, the idea of bringing out the buck to slaughter the suitors with. Well, if you read the poem, you know that Penelope came up with that one by herself. Nobody put that into her mind. It was her idea. And by the way, she didn't think of it for the sake of Zeus. She thought of it for, and I think it's, it's, it's a remarkable, it's almost a joke in Homer, that this young man who spent three years gazing at this woman in front of him, aspiring to marry her, thinks that even though the hidden gods that he's never seen are agents, he can't even imagine that this mortal woman who he's looked at with his own eyes has that degree of hidden agency. But she does. And yet, the attribution of agency to the gods, not to the gods, where is our freedom, where is our choice, that's also very, that's not always clear in Homer, it's very hidden. Um, Hermes' warning to Aegisthus is recapitulated by Odysseus in Book 18. When he warns the suitor and feminists, the least objectionable of the suitors, he says, you know, you're a good guy, you should get out of here and go home before something bad happens. And in feminists, the text says, and I'll quote it, went back across the room, heart saddened within him, shaking his head. For in his spirit he saw the evil, but still could not escape his doom. For Athena had bound him fast. Well, I think we all know what that feels like. I think everybody's been fat, bound fast by, by Athena from time to time, but, but, you, but you have to stop and think about the mystery that that presents to you. The opening of the poem says that Odysseus failed to save his men because of their own wild recklessness, the phrase Zeus repeats, the power of their cursed stomachs when they ate the cattle of the sun. On the other hand, what were they supposed to do? Starve to death? You know, who is it to stop the winds that you find in that island? If you're looking for who to blame, it's, it's really not clear. So it would take, it would take you know, ages to unwind, I think, the, the difficulties of Zeusian apologetics in the Odyssey. So let me suggest an answer to the question of what are human beings responsible for? What can they be blamed for? This is what I have, have derived from the text myself. They're blamed, as we have noticed, when they put themselves beyond the reach of persuasion, beyond the claims of other people, beyond the claims of a flowing an ongoing human discourse about what it's good to do and what it's not good to do. 
One of the most memorable aspects of the Odyssey is the way Homer shows him internalizing these social conversations by considering it for himself, whether he should do this or that. And the other thing they're blamed for is impiety, for forgetting the gods. So what do I mean by this impiety? It's not just not paying your taxes or your tribute by sacrifice. It's forgetting the powers that curtail yours. Penelope gives a clear account of her piety when she describes how careful she has been not to forget about the power of Aphrodite like Helen did. Not meaning that Helen fell in love with Paris, but she forgot to think that Aphrodite's power would move on in the fullness of time, and she may well want to go home again to Menelaus. But because Penelope remembers this, this power, although no human life is free of Aphrodite's power, Penelope gets to use it. And she uses it to stabilize an unstable political situation for the time it takes for her son to finish growing up. Most of all, though, impiety is brought in to best relief by looking at guest friendship and the reception of castaways. It's Zeus we're constantly reminded who protects beggars and supplants, immigrants and criminals. So let's look a little bit more closely at this divine law of hospitality. Um, you guys still awake? It's <laughs> working out. Yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> louder, please. Louder. 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 <laughs> <laughs> let's 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 try this. Is that any better? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> okay. The part of, of the present that I have in the back of my mind in thinking about this, reading Homer, obviously, is is our delightful and incoherent political obsession in this country with immigration. <laughs> We have to admit it's overwhelming and disruptive. And I think we should probably admit that as a phenomenon and as a bone of contention, it's going to multiply like Hydra's heads for the foreseeable future. I'm personally very curious to see what comes of it. And I'm sorry I won't be around to see what happens. But one caveat, this lecture isn't a simple lecture about US immigration policy. Uh, it's obviously incredibly complicated. There are, you know, there are aspects of it which have nothing to do with Homer. There are gigantic populations of mo millions of people who are going to be moving around this planet because of climate change. And it's going to be a mess, I think. And I think it's important to think about how you comport yourself towards that mess. That doesn't mean that I know what the policy should be or that I think Homer knows what the policy should be. But when you feel distress about the dysfunction of the whole thing, it does seem to me that, that, that one of the things you wish you could have is a better persuasive deliberation about the facts of the case. And if and when that happens, one of the things that deliverance brings to the table is the state of your mind and the state of your souls with respect to the burdens placed upon them by guest friendship, hospitality, supplicants showing up at your border. And so my aim here is simply to get Homer's help, you know, ultimately with the state of my soul and my mind in that regard. So, in Greek, the law of guest friendship is called xenia, based on the root xenos, which means stranger, the word from which we get the modern term xenophobia. The laws and traditions of xenia are employed, they're varied, and they're defied throughout Homer's poems. And a lot of trouble flows when they get to fog. Paris, for example, was a guest of Menelaus when he supposedly kidnapped Helen. And that was a violation of the traditions of guest friendship that was worth killing for. Menelaus, who's understandably sensitive to the proprieties of hospitality, notes in Book 15 that, it, that it's very improper to turn a guest away before he wants to leave. And it's equally improper to detain one. Calypso and Polyphemus detained their guests too long. Circe and the Phaeacians did the right thing. Diomedes and Glaucus, for example, discover on the battlefield in the Iliad that their fathers were guest friends. And they decide, therefore, they're, they're some kind of family, even though they're on the opposite sides of the war. And they decide not to try to kill each other after all. And indeed, among the wealthy, the exchange of guest gifts was, and still is to some degree, a social form that establishes alliances between power centers. You know, it's a form of networking. It's a form of advertising. 
tourist accommodations. But Zeni included, and most of the emphasis is on in the Iliad, hospitality offered to beggars and criminals and immigrants. It's useful, I think, to know that this extension was understood by the Greeks themselves to have a great deal of significance. All of the, the minor Athenian historians write about Athens being the, the glory of Greece and the soul of Greece, and they almost single out, without exception, as the talisman of Athens' superiority, the exalted tradition of hospitality of strangers. They had their origin, they all claim, in Athenian generosity and nobility. Some modern historians would claim it also had its origins in Athenian economic needs. That's fair enough. Too many, uh, too many Athenian writers, too many Athenian writers to list, claim in specific that it was Athens' civic devotion to putting an end to savagery among human beings and establishing justice between peoples. It was best shown by their having been the first city to welcome refugees on a wide scale. The typical claim for the glory of Athens is that Athens was the first to demonstrate to the world how to live by the principle of the proper protection of supplicants. So how do Homer's characters understand this obligation? We can look at a few examples of that. One is when Eumaeus sees Odysseus attacked by the dogs, he drives them off and says to him that if a stranger, Xenos, had been in, in, injured, in front of his house, he would have covered him with shame. He didn't say, if you're crossing over my border and a mountain lion eats you up, man, that's your problem. He says, I will be covered with shame. He then says, come along, old sir, to my shelter, so that you also may first be filled to contentment with food and wine, and then tell me where you come from and about the sorrow you've been suffering. That Odysseus had been suffering was evident by the fact that he had to go to somebody like Eumaeus for help to begin with. So these are three of the four basic steps of hospitality in these poems. First step, and it's a tradition, it's a, it has a gnomic force of the law. First step is you offer the safety and shelter and warmth. No questions asked. Then you offer food and drink. No questions asked. And only then do you ask questions. You ask the stranger who they are and what their story is. And the fourth step is gift giving and, and if possible, the exchange of gifts. Now, Eumaeus, for example, seats Odysseus on the best cover he has in the house. He has to take it off of his own bed and sit him down. And Odysseus thanks him with the formula, may the gods grant you all that you desire most. Zeus grant you all that you desire most. <coughs> you, know who, but you, you know what's going to happen in this poem is that Eumaeus is going to indicate what he desires most, and Odysseus is going to supply it. Um, he calls Eumaeus stranger, since even then he doesn't know his name. And Eumaeus, who's very poor, but he takes pride in his propriety, he replies, stranger, that us, it wouldn't be right to me not to honor a stranger, even if he was a lot worse off than you. All strangers and beggars are from Zeus. He then adds that his guest gift will be small, but because of his poverty, it will be precious. So what does it mean to say that all beggars and strangers are from Zeus? Does Zeus like assign them street corners? Would Zeus, on some inscrutable whim, lay it down that beggars should be treated with dignity? Does he use it to test people for generosity? Surely Christians easily hear an echo of Jesus' prophecy in Matthew 25, when he says something to the effect of, as you created one of, as you treated one of the least of these my brothers, so you did that to me. What is a Homeric Greek here, though? Well, here's another example. In Book 17, when Odysseus joins the suitors as a beggar, and Antinous, the most ignorant of the suitors, objects to his presence at the dinner party because he says, beggars ruin our feasting. Now, that's worth thinking about, right? Do beggars ruin your feasting? If they do, you should think about it. Think it through. Why that would be, what it would mean. <clears throat> Eumaeus replies that such a comment doesn't fit well with Antinous' noble appearance. And he says, besides, no one goes looking for beggars, but you do feed the ones who show up. Later, Odysseus singles Antinous out for testing. He wants to push it a little bit further. And he says to him, <coughs> quote, you look like a king, therefore you ought to give me a better present of food than the others. 
Odysseus explains that he was once prosperous himself, and he tells a long tale of how Zeus spoiled that prosperity by making him too greedy. Antinous ignores this and threatens him, and Odysseus points out that there's plenty of food around, and it came to him, to Antinous, for free, as a gift of an already wealthy man, to an already wealthy man. If you can't be generous with that, Odysseus says, then your mind really doesn't match your looks. This one, Antinous strikes him by throwing a footstool at him. And the other suitors are embarrassed, the poem says, and they object to Antinous, and this is a rare place in Homer where he puts the a reply in the mouth of many people said something like this, right? In other words, it's the expression of social norms. They say, you did badly, Antinous, hitting this vagabond. It's a curse on you if he turns out to be some god from heaven. For the gods do take on all sorts of transformations, appearing as strangers from elsewhere. And thus they range at large in cities, watching to see which men keep the laws and which are violent. So it looks like the suitors do have a crude and literalist reading of the law of hospitality. Rather than seeing a beggar in a beggar an image of the Lord, they harbor a pious fear that there might actually be a god in disguise. The gods are tricky. They could disguise themselves. But Eumaeus had said when Odysseus thanked him that his generosity was a matter of his own justice his own sense of what's proper, regardless of the outward appearances. And Odysseus suggested to Antinous that generosity to the destitute is a matter of dignity and even self-consistency, almost Socratic self-consistency. You're in contradiction, he implies, if your wealth or station isn't matched by your generosity, if social power and outward grace isn't matched by graceful acts. Socrates' prayer to Pan at the end of the Phaedrus is essentially a request that his outward grace matches in qualities. You can see, too, that there's an implicit accusation you know, this is his mouth here against Agamemnon, whose social station was not at all matched by his outward grace. Not in his six. So these are three reasons, and they seem like they're different. Suffolk might be a god in disguise, or generosity is a matter of internalized propriety and justice, or else generosity is an outward display of nobility and king, kingliness, a test to see whether public station is validated by public actions. But what ties together these accounts of hospitality is the knowledge that, that appearances are deceptive, that you can't judge people by their looks, their health, their wealth, or their station in life. On the crudest level, a beggar might be a god in disguise, and indeed, you never really know, do you, who someone is? It takes years to know if someone's really honorable, or powerful, or Zeus. <laughs> you may ask those from his own experience that those born into kingly families may end up serfs through no fault of their own. And he remembers being treated kindly by the powerful even though he was a bought slave. Most of all, he knows that his own appearance doesn't match his inner worth. While others see him as a slave, he behaves with nobility nonetheless. This makes him a little pompous, but you can't have everything. <laughs> Odysseus' remarks to Antinous make it clear that the chasm between appearance and reality runs both ways in the guest friend encounter. He tells of his own fall from a higher state and attributes it to Zeus because he wants to divert attention from his own greed so as to point out that even as he is, he is much more than he appears, Antinous may be less. Rightly understood, the laws of hospitality expose what appearance hides, the worth of both persons, but especially the host. Remembering the power of Zeus means remembering that you may change places with this beggar at any time. To feel securely above him, or to feel contempt or dismissal of him, is, in effect, to insult Zeus by doubting Zeus' power to change the program any time he feels like. Let me take a look at one more instance of guest friend piety in the Odyssey, which is Theopomenos and Telemachus. Theopomenos shows up as Telemachus is making a sacrifice and says, hey, I need a ride because I'm a murderer. <laughs> and they're after me. And Telemachus just takes him on the boat. Now, that seems like a nutty thing to do. So it's worth thinking why he did it. 
Telemachus, and it's right after Telemachus has responded to him, he said, who are you? And Telemachus, he spent the first four books of this poem talking about he doesn't really know who his father is and who am I and what's my station in the world. He looks at him and says, I'm the son of Odysseus. Somehow his time with, with Helen and, and Melias taking care of that one. He knows who he is for the first time. He says, I'm the son of Odysseus. And perhaps he's nice to Theoclymenos because he wants to go home and try to kill the suitors and he may be on the run soon himself. Perhaps he's just like a callow youth and this seems like it's a great adventure. You know, when, when I first gave my teenagers cars, I thought, God, who knows what kind of hitchhikers they're going to pick up. <laughs> All you can do about that is pray, really. But unlike Odysseus, but like Odysseus, I'm sorry, Homer makes clear, Telemachus, although he does this, he does it really thoughtfully. Under the guise of politeness, he disarms the Plumbinus before he lets him in the boat. And then he sits down right beside him to keep an eye on him in case he gets up to something bad. When they get to Ithaca, his first idea is to palm him off on one of the suitors. But when Theoclymenus starts talking in a way that makes it clear to Telemachus that that could get him in trouble with the suitors, he changes his mind and, and makes different arrangements to protect him. It's sort of like when Odysseus went very, very quickly from wanting to kill the beggar Iros to moderating his anger and hitting him in such a way that he could just get him out of the hall so he wouldn't be killed in the slaughter. He took pity on him. So I just want to note that, that modern immigration laws penalize desperate poverty. Right? Economic immigration is not legitimate immigration somehow. They desperate, they penalize lying if you tell make up stories in your asylum application, and they're kind of tilted against criminals. But who is it more than a desperately impoverished person who's in need of hospitality? And what kind of false identification with your own security does it take not to see in desperate policy a state that you could be inadvertently reduced to any day that you happen to wake up in, say, Ukraine? Not to say if someday you're fated to wake up old or disabled. We call it compassion, us moderns, when we have pity on the helpless masses feeling violence and poverty. And by compassion, we mean a paternalistic condescension that asserts one's moral virtue. It's moral virtue because it lets us condemn the moral turpitude of the oppressors, those other human beings whose fault this must be and who aren't sufficiently compassionate like us. But in Homeric terms, pity for the helpless is not like that. Pity for the helpless is never divorced from pity for yourself. <coughs> from the knowledge that reality is, so, is never so clear, and that any day Zeus could lower the hammer of Thor. And that's a true description of our world, I think, especially when one considers the way time changes everything. And no matter how secure life is, a new generation is going to grow up and disrupt and risk that security. We don't control everything and we don't control the future, and both of these things are risky, and if you have any sense, they cause fear. What about the people who lie in their asylum application? Well, Odysseus puts on a book-length clinic about how to lie in your asylum <laughs> application. <laughs> he is a master of storytelling, and he tells a lot of them, and some of them sound plausible, and some of them sound like fairy tales, and none of them can really be completely true. One might even call it creative nonfiction. <laughs> it's not only natural to do that when you're trying to explain yourself. I think it's probably also inescapable. I think it's necessary. The bare facts of a thing, the surface appearance of it, doesn't tell you what's hidden in it. Within it, it doesn't tell you what the real meaning of an experience is. If you want to display display the real meaning of an experience, you have to start embroidering and making things up. Fairy tales, well, I'm, I'm, I've got whole sections here I'm trying to skip, and that's the reason I'm, I'm hesitating. Um, if, you, if, you, if you are open to hearing people's stories as stories, as being more full of meaning than a simple, unperjured truth might be, that means that you're ready to admit that things might not be simply and easily what they seem like. 
that appearances may have to change, or that an artist may have to manipulate the appearances for the divine spirit to be recognized. To respect the way that God's work, then, is to respect this aspect of human life. Hence, Eumaeus tells Odysseus that he's going to treat him well, whether or not he tells what Eumaeus foresees is going to be a self-serving lie. And Odysseus accepts Eumaeus' story of his youth and his enslavement without arguing with it, even though Eumaeus had to have made up large parts of it. Because it, it describes knowledge of things that no small child can know. It's what it means that matters. And piety represents remembering that with people, meaning isn't so easy to judge. It's as hard as knowing a god when one happens to come about. Okay, and what about criminals now? Isn't hospitality to criminals scary, dangerous, and too risky, imprudent? Isn't security more important? Isn't Telemachus foolish to let a confessed murderer into his boat? Well, yeah, <laughs> he is. It is dangerous. But it's also the first positive act of a newly self-confident, self-asserting, independent young man. And his first statement as an agent is a beautifully elegant and simple one. He looks at Theoclamenos and he says, and I quote, I will not willingly trust you away from my ship. That's it. And this statement, the one thing, the one thing you know from the Homeric frame is that this statement is the completion of a sacrifice to Athena. So he's not nuts. He does disarm him. He does seat him so that he can catch him if he causes trouble. And over time, he's just going to have to watch and see what this stranger is like and decide how to judge him. So that's the final point I want to make about guest friendship. That it's always dangerous. It simply is. It's a form of piety that's always dangerous. And I think you can think of almost any book in the Odyssey and you can think of an example. It's a form of danger that Homeric piety enjoins on. Another way of putting it, Homeric piety, which is the same thing as Homeric responsibility, is risky. Bringing strangers into your territory, extending them alms and protection, accepting the danger they pose, recognizes and acts this proper relationship to this aspect of the divine. If you were to attribute all danger to human choice and accept responsibility for managing it, then accepting such dangers is indeed irresponsible. The modern way of putting it is that security must always outweigh idealism. You may come across the strangers only when it's safe, when it won't be disruptive, when you won't risk paying a high price for it. But you also, of course, in reality, you may come across the strangers under compulsion. It's a delusion you think you don't need to. And that contradiction in the modern way of thinking about it is what tells you that there's something wrong with it. So, does this image of Homeric Piety towards guest friends seemed implausible. Does it make more sense to begin each practical deliberation primarily calculating about your, your safety and your security? Consider that the larger, dis, largest disruption of safety and security in these books is the passage of time and the turnover of generations. What, what drives the action in the Odyssey is Orestes coming into manhood, Nazca coming into womanhood, Columbus is coming into manhood. That has the power to disrupt everything. You think in terms of your children, and Odysseus and Penelope rather unusually do, then if what seems to you most important is a stable world, free of shifting borders, free of shifting definitions, clear about core and simply assimilated commitments about, about boundaries like gender definitions, then almost always the actual shifting of the generations in time makes you feel compelled to seek restoration to a simpler past, which is to say a mythical past, when all the gods have walked the earth as themselves like they did on Baikia. This nostalgic longing for the clarity and security of the mythical past I think is the essence of the songs the sirens sing to Odysseus as he passes. It's a, they're tempting him with nostalgia. Sometimes nostalgia overwhelms all of us, but as the book shows, it doesn't always have to cause a shipwreck. You might wonder too if this is too dark a view of human life. 
you know, if we are playthings of the gods, it's kind of a subhuman life. We have sworn of agency. But if we control our own futures entirely, well, you don't have to live too long to know that that's a dark future, too. But because the future is murky, before, because it's unclear, because you can't foresee the boundaries of responsibility, even though you have it, unless you rely on profits. And there, I think Homer demonstrates aren't worth much except for political purposes. And you don't want to live by a coward's nostalgia for the clarity of the myth of the past. Well, then, in this world, you got no choice. You just got to invite trouble across your threshold. The best example of that is a wedding. A wedding is guest friendship par excellence, man. And how many of those turn out well? <laughs> but would we be humans without them? I don't think so. Now, Penelope is a lot like her husband. She's careful not to overassume that, that, that she knows what's going to happen in the future, that appearances are simple, that, that the way the world is structured now is the way it will always be structured. She hears all prophecies as hypotheses to test. But I think she best describes what it means to accept this confusing, and in, the kind of confusing and impartial and in, in, kind of confusing and inconclusive partial ending, like the one Homer gives us in the Odyssey. Right? How is this the end of the story? Nobody really knows. It seems like a lot of things aren't resolved. Maybe there's a peace treaty for a while. Odysseus is going to have to leave again. I mean, well, how is this an end? Well, it's not an end because it's human life. But she insists after she's recognized Odysseus, that he recount the tale of the prophecy of Tiresias, which enjoins him to travel again after reestablishing a temporary peace in Ithaca. And she responds to this news with her final, her last quoted speech in the poem. And what she says is, then there's hope for the future. Thank you. still that long. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate your kindness in doing it, and, and I hope someone wants to object to something. <laughs> yeah? Is rejecting generous? <laughs> there's a scene in the story that we read today in which there's a very nice cup that's described, a gold cup, and it has silver on the outside, but it's also described as being a gift. So is re-gifting a generous act? Yeah, I, I don't know. I bet it depends on who's doing it and when. I, you know, I think... But I think it is clear that in the world of the Odyssey, things like cups and gowns and armor have the and, you know have the, the currency of currency. So so is, if you re-give money, is that re-gifting? <laughs> yeah. All right. So I object <laughs> to, to the to the too facile equation of guest friendship and wedding. And my objection takes the form of the following notation, subnote, right? With all my worldly goods I be endowed. No guest friend has worldly goods with which to endow his hopes for her. Yeah. <laughs> no guest friend has worldly goods with which to endow her or his hopes. So I'm taking that as a yeah. point at which guest friendship and wedding, one orientation to the terror of the future and another That's orientation right. to the terror of the future seem to me to be starkly different, although no doubt in other ways there are a lot. Yeah. No, I think that's right. And, and, and you know, of course, I'm going to point out that that phrase may not have been in, in an ancient Homeric wedding ceremony. Oh, and except I, we know that dowries are exchanged. Though. Yes, yeah. Um, but there's change, right? There, there's, uh, That's true. Yeah. But I, I guess, I guess, you know, I want, I want to shield myself from your, your quite just criticism. I mean, I, you know, I don't mean to do justice to a wedding by saying it's a form of guest friendship. I mean to say that it is dangerous in the same way that guest friendship is, because you are welcoming someone into your household, or you are making a common household in them, with them, with really no basis to know if this is going to be scary or good. You're, you're, you've heard some stories. 
You heard some stories and you have some hopes. Yes. And you may even have heard some prophecies. Right. And you may even have convinced yourself that you have an all-powerful agency, and if you have spoken these words of promise, it's going to make things good. But it's, it's still scary. It's scary to watch people do it. Yeah, I agree with that. <coughs> yeah. Uh, but it does seem to me that, there, that, it, that, that the difference between, say, wedding and guest friendship points to a kind of complexity in the terror of the future, if I may use that slogan. Yeah, yeah. A kind of complexity in the terror of the future that, um, that adds a layer, adds a layer of uh, hope against hope to the layer of hope. Well, you know, in one of the sections I cut out of this talk, you know, I had I I tried to think about what the what some of the contemporary arguments against open borders, for example, are. Um, I mean, it seems to me that open borders. I, I mean, I, and I will say that I think I can, you know, there are left wing criticisms of you know the desire to close the borders and build walls and be very careful about who you let in, and there are uh, right wing criticisms about this. Caricature notion that we just have open borders and there won't be any problem. I think they're all. I think they're both correct. I think this is one of those cases where, where you know you can't resolve the argument because everybody's speaking on a partial truth. Uh, but but I do think that one of the fears one hears articulated about open borders, for example, is that is that if you let in people with entirely heterogeneous sets of cultural assumptions and fundamental commitments about what a human community is and should be then you won't have any legitimated constitutional basis for a common deliberation and a common conversation. Whereas a, a, a marriage, it seems to me, is there nothing else? It's either the polluted notion that you already have that, or it's the, <laughs> commi or it's the commitment to try to build it. Right? And so in that sense, I think it is a, it's also dangerous, but it's a further, it is a different kind of thing. Uh, and it is something that requires a lot of hope. Can I ask one more thing? Why do you think Theoclaminus is, is a seer? He's specifically yeah. identified as a prophet. So you you Sorry, why <laughs> do you think, David, that Theoclaminus is a seer? He is specifically identified as a prophet. And they came in for a certain criticism. Oh. Yeah, um, let me... He's a murdering prophet. Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I have a lot of thoughts about Theoclaminus, but I can't fi finally answer this. And, and let me say that, that I don't feel jealous of the podium in this regard either, right? <laughs> well, you know, if there's somebody else who thinks they know what the significance is, I'd be really happy to hear about it. I think, you know, there's, a, there's some recent commentary on the, on the Odyssey, which, which is interested in the notion that you see in it a confrontation, a deliberate confrontation, between the human future where, you know, Eumaeus is going to have to be the partner of Columbus and ruling the society instead of the slave in a mythological past. And the prophets tend to be, speak in terms of the mythological past. The, the, the speeches in Hades tend to be in terms of a kind of clear-cut mythological past. And they're tribal, too. There's no Trojans in Hades. And, and, so, and so one way of thinking about it is that Theoclonimus is there as, like, it's the one other way that you could be approaching things, right, through theocracy as opposed to through the kind of political reforms that Odysseus is going to be banking on to secure his son's future. Um, I, I also think that, I think there's an inside joke on Homer's part, which is that Eumaeus makes it clear that a lot of times people who are in need of help as supplicants will tell you anything they think you want to hear. And the Aquinas does. Yeah. So do you think there is such a thing as analysis of risks and benefits? Which everybody seems to be doing now. <clears throat> uh, yeah, of course there is. Of course there is. Uh, but, I, but I also think that it's a, it's a distorting way of understanding your position in the world. Um, and it can be both at the same time. You don't have to choose between them. Um, and one of the ways, it's, it's usually pretty easy to identify risk. It's a lot harder to identify benefits because benefits is embedded in the question of what is beneficial to human beings, which is also goes sometimes under the color of the, the question of the nature of the good. Um, 
And you know, risk benefit calculations, like most, you know, like most calculations in physics or in biology or whatever, you know, tends to confine its terms to matters that can be measured and quantified and measures of the body, right? So security of the body is easy to establish as a benefit. And it's easy then to, to say if you are risking the security of the body that you're stepping outside of the, the, the regime of calculation. Um, I think that's kind of imposed on you by risk management calculation to some degree. It's the reason why, you know, if you have a risk management committee at college and you have a bunch of students who are interested in risk sports like, you know, solo rock climbing or, you know, seeing how much LSD they can take at the same time, <laughs> you know, that, that's disruptive to the regime of risk management. On the other hand, acting as if your life is your own is a sort of fundamental act of, of human agency. But it's just, it can't show up as legitimate once you're committed to a certain kind of terms. So yeah, I think life has suffered without a lot of risk management committees. I've been on many of them. I think they improve a lot of things. I think you've got to watch out that they, that they don't make you into a smaller kind of creature. likelihood of happening and the severity of it happening to you and then the third dimension being the severity of not doing it towards the other person or towards the other body so making it kind of a logarithmic three part scale as opposed to a, huh. a I'm not quite sure aspect. I follow that. Could you just give me the, the logarithm one more time? Uh, likelihood is a, is a Y. Severity is an X if we're doing like a three factor matrix here. Uh, and then the Z involved would be the, the the severity against the other entity were we to not do perform this action. So right. quantifying that as well. And then I mean this is yeah. how in I other words a duty to protect of some sort. What was that? A duty to protect of some sort? Yeah. And to protect what? What you can give you an yeah. example. Yeah. I had a Leonidas moment during the Tubbs fire. Myself and a firefighter were the last engine on the coast and we came upon a one acre fire with a blazing car in the middle of it. Was there risk? Yes. Was there risk to us? That was one evaluation we had to make. The second one is if we don't do something, what happens to the town five miles up the road? Right. Those are those are yeah no those are those are to important calculations to make. This way, this is always considering within the mind, right? If I go this way, what happens? If I go that way, what happens? Um, that duty to protect another person to calculate the severity of what's going to happen to another person. Yeah, that seems I guess obvious to me that that's something that one has to think about. And I guess that's the reason why I pair the terms risk and blame. Because I'm interested not so much in criticizing risk as a sort of you know functional sociological term management concept, but in looking at what's implied by by having the opposite of it be blame as opposed to you know submission to the Lord, for example, or you know acceptance of accident or something like that. So so it's, it, I think. Uh, I was, in the way that I'm thinking about it anyway, you know, I've got no problems with that duty to protect and to calculate how severe a disruption this might be to another person. But if you think, oh, I'm going to be accountable if I do anything that might disrupt another person, then you, and I don't want to be blamed, <clears throat> then you step into a new kind of territory, it seems to me. And I, and I guess I just think that, uh, you know, and it's not a territory where humans can live as adults. You know, I, I think there's, there are storms coming, right? And you know, I may have lived my life without the kind of terrible, you know, in, immigrant, suffused, violent storms which are, my kids are going to live through. But you know, it would be a certain kind of idiocy if I, if I then raised them by telling them stories about my youth when the storms weren't that bad, right? As opposed to like getting them to stand up to the ones that are coming. And, 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 and admiring and respecting and to some degree envying the fact that they're going to get to deal with the burden of that. Um, 
And that means I'm not primarily attuned towards trying to protect them. I'm tuned towards trying to open the door to the life they can have. And it does feel a little different to me. But it, but it is, all these things are so, uh, you know, they're so changeable depending on the particular people and the instances involved. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Or, I wish that you had agreed with me more. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I certainly don't think it's a legitimate thing to, like, you know, you know, on a lark and danger the integrity and autonomy of other people. I think that kind of sucks. You know? Is that is that how it's said? Yeah, yeah. 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 Maybe it depends a little bit on what you what the axis of benefit is. Whether the ben benefit is like risk to me, benefit to me, and then the third axis is benefit to others. But maybe benefit should be both to me as well as others. And it's back to the two. You just to redefine benefit. Yeah, but aren't you also and I don't hear much about this, and maybe I haven't seen it, is the sense of duty. Mm. I mean, That's right. you're when, when, when that. you're talking about um, kind of risk-benefit, a sterile risk-benefit, or a, a one where you just say, well, what's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to my children? Uh, that's legitimate. But we have, throughout history, people who feel that they have duties to others or duties to to some higher being, and, and, and what you mentioned in um, the Odyssey about Zeus, you know, this duty uh, to uh, strangers to provide for them, that's, that is something that, that humanities has, has got, has, has got to uh, abide by in his, in his own thinking, I, I believe. Um, so duty is, is something that is all part of the mix. Yeah. I mean, I guess I'm not quite deliberately trying to replace the notion of duty with the notion of piety. And with the notion of, of you know, acting in terms of, the, you know, the real concrete confusions of life. Right? Whereas to identify duties is to simplify those, those things. Um, so yeah, you could look at it as duty in another way. Um, I don't get much of a sense of duty in the in the Homeric world merely because it would mean it means abstract commitments to a principle without their embodiment in in particulars. And Homer is so vividly rooted in those particulars. <clears throat> and it can, but it can look the same. But yeah, Julie? Yeah. Or, and then Ernie, any see you in the back with Julie? I, I, Courage, um, courage in the face of risk, and what that would what that would look like for you. How do you understand that? Is it courage to do your duty, or are you, is courage? Do you mean something else by courage? No, no, I don't. I mean, I don't think of it that way. And, and I, you know, let me think of the way I think of it. I could claim it's Homeric. I'm not sure I can, um, but. I think there are a lot of things in modern life which you are enjoined not to do because they're dangerous. And when people enjoin you not to do things because they're dangerous, they're right about the danger, generally. And older people know more about the dangers than young people do. Right? And young people are in some kind of deluded notion that they know more about them than other people do, and so they're going to be cool. And you know, everybody's deluded in a sense, right? <laughs> Because, because what people don't realize they're deluded about is the, is the other part of the sentence, the part where you say ought not to, because it's dangerous. Right? It's the ought, which I think is the, or ought not, which is the realm of you know, social control, and sure, among other things. And it does seem to me that you, know, that, that you ought not to pick up confessed murderers outside the prison in your car I'm pretty comfortable with that one, you know. But but uh, but to say to people you ought not to do something else which is dangerous is to is, is to say. I, I mean, as as a, as a social act and as a paternal act, it's to say my fear is more important than your desire for freedom. And it seems to me that 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 one of the things parents have to do is they have to stifle that fear. 
And I'm happy to call him courage about the world. But yeah, Ernie? In what sense can a king returning to his kingdom be called an immigrant? Um, and, and if he can be called an immigrant, what does the term immigrant mean? So, I mean, it seems to me that the suitors were probably more immigrants than Odysseus. Uh, yeah, than, than, uh, than and I don't know how, in what sense, you can use his experience to uh, tease out the notion of immigrant. Maybe there is a way. I mean, I, I can understand him. he's posing as an immigrant, but that's what he's doing. He's posing as an immigrant, and is that to be lost? Yeah. In now. Yeah, I guess. I mean, I, I think there there is. I, mean, I, I try not to talk too much too much about him as an immigrant, as opposed to what he said about <coughs> guest friendship. He's a really tough case because he lost his homeland and he's trying to regain it. But the terms in which he regained it is going to make it really different than the way it was before. He's no longer going to be the king he was 20 years ago. It's not like he's going to restore a kingdom where he ruled gently like a father and there was prosperity else everywhere. <coughs> I mean, partly he's going to start by murdering 108 people. And, and even back then, you know, they admit that he was killing people with poison and arrows when he was mild as a father. Um, so, I mean, he's changed. Conditions of rule have changed. He's not the nice guy he used to be. It's a different thing. So in that sense, going home again, <coughs> I'm sorry, it's pretty complicated. But I guess I want to know... I mean, he certainly is, a, he's the most clearly kind of an immigrant when he shows up on the shores of Laetheia, and they invite him to stay. Um, and so I, but I guess I'm, I'm still wondering what's at stake in that question. Can I, can I just go back to Ernie for a minute? I just want to know what's at, what's at stake in, the, in whether or not he's an immigrant or what an immigrant is. Well, he's a wanderer. Yeah. Wanderers and immigrants <coughs> may be different things. Right, that's I mean, true. Immigrants are, the, it seems to me, are people who, who come to want to make a new home. And they, and they are, they are, they're aliens to begin with, and they want to now become, come to, come, come to a country to make it their home. I mean, as I say, the suitors are, in a sense, more immigrants than, than, than <coughs> the Christians are. Uh, uh, right. Because they wanted to come to some place that wasn't their home, and they wanted to, you know, make it their home. That doesn't mean that all immigrants are evil people. Like, you know, right? No, I hear you. Sort of so, uh, so, but it, it seems to me that the wanderers and and I tend to people who move from different countries on their way someplace seems to be something different than an immigrant. Yeah, well, I, th I, think that's, I think that's right. I see what you mean. And, and to push that a little further, an immigrant would want to be, would be somebody who wants to come and join an already existent national story or community story, yeah. as opposed to just like, you know, mix in in the, in the heterogeneous party, right, on their way somewhere else. And, and I, I see that, that distinction. It seems to me, what I'm tempted to think about it is in terms of, of the longer Cretan story that Odysseus tells in the part that you guys read where he goes to these places, he's not forgotten where his home is, he's on the way somewhere else, but he's going to live there for seven, eight years of time, um, and could presumably remain. Um, and it's not always easy to know what comes of those things, you know? I, I, I've heard a lot of immigrant stories lately of, of people who move somewhere thinking they'd be there until the war stopped in their home, and man, 30 years later they have a family and business. Uh, but, but wandering, and the other, the other missing term there, and I, I wonder if this is what you have in mind, is piracy, right? Because that's another form of wandering, is, is, is where you know, your job in the world is not to, not to hunt or fish or herd animals or raise crops, but it's just to go somewhere else to collect, collect booty. Well, I, 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 have, I have nothing quite in mind. I'm just, I'm just asking okay. the, the question. It seems to be an interesting yeah. thing when, when he's came returning home. Um, and I am playing a little fast and loose, I guess, with the word with the word immigrant, because what I'm primarily interested in is this phenomenon where people that you don't know and can't read show up on your threshold or your border, 
and you have to decide how I'm going to treat them. And they might tell you, I want to join your national story, and they might want to tell you, I just want to get away from these people that are hunting me. Or they might tell you, I just want to make some money for a while and send it home, and hopefully I can move back. And you, you know, you don't know if that's true. You don't know if they're lying or telling you what they think is true. You don't even know what's going to happen to me today, really. And I guess it's that fundamental aspect of the experience which kind of fascinates me. I think it seems to me immigrance is often a term implied in the retrospect. I, you know, I think it, you know members of my family that came here 120 years ago. They were just trying to get away from someplace, right? I call them immigrants. They call themselves refugees. Um, but again, I'm not sure where that would go. Um, I feel like I'm not doing justice to what you're asking about, but well, maybe you know, I can do it later. I, I don't think there, there wasn't a, an answer. There would be, it was just a, it was a, it was a real question, and I appreciate what you said. Yeah. Uh, Mike, Mike? Yeah, I'm just thinking, going back 100 years ago, when these gods writing Greeks and the irrational be such as the Greeks, the Homeric Greeks, had what you call the shame culture. You contrast that with guilt culture and uh, some of that in the Bible. But so when things are risk and blame, it seems blame and guilt go together. But we should be thinking about shame, which motivates how you treat the indigent. That sense, I think what you're telling us, is we can learn from the Greek sense, which involves a sense of shame different from just a sense of guilt. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy with that. I mean, I have all kinds of discomforts with that shame versus guilt yeah. cut. But, 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 uh, but yeah, I mean, shame is a, is, a good, is a good way of asking yourself, you know, how do I, you know, if this is what I'm remembered for, am I happy? That's a good question to ask. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Um, so given a distribution of the outcomes from the act of hospitality, to what degree do you think the minimum probability of negative outcomes can poison the well of future hospitality? And do you think you have any way to combat that poisoning of the well? Because given that distribution, it is of some minimum probability. Yeah. Um, what, 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 what would it mean to combat it? If I combat it and won, what would happen? I, I guess I think about like anecdotal things that happen that for, like forever that change the way I look at hospitality. You know, something, an error, something uh, negative happens to me, and then forevermore, I always treat all possible outcomes in the same way. Right. Whereas in hospitality, in Zania, there's a, an engagement of vulnerability and trust that you're always exposed to that, I guess, minimum probability of negative outcomes. Well, I, I guess one point I'm really concerned to make with about Homer, about Homer is that you're exposed to vulnerability. That doesn't mean you're dumb enough to be trusting. <laughs> it means it doesn't matter of piety to be vulnerable. Right? And, and yeah, there's all sorts of ways in which, yeah, people hear one horrifying story and they, you know, it changes their behavior. But they're stupid, right? <laughs> um, and and in, in terms of my lecture, they are, they are inadequately open to persuasive and rational speech. That's, another, that's the other form of, of uh, that's the other place where human beings can make free actions according to my thesis. To assert their freedom. I, I have a weird one. Uh, I have a, a comment, maybe. Uh, you know the expression, you know, as I've heard it, um, you know, never lend money. If you lend money to a friend, uh, you're, uh, fr it's risky to uh, uh, lend money to a friend, like you ruin ruined French, a French, it's a weird uh, right. problem, it's like, I know it happens kind of to me, it happens to someone else, I know he, somebody, want, his friend wanted to borrow money from him, and they were really good friends, and uh, he refused to do it, and the friend who, were, who didn't get the money was just, like, broken. And that ruined the friendship. And I was kind of wondering if there's any tie with, like, say, the, dif the difference between uh, someone coming to your house and you, someone that you know, a friend, and you essentially giving them something you want to letting them stay there, as opposed to maybe a. Uh, well, why didn't he loan him the money? Huh? I mean, these are individual things. Why didn't the friend loan him the money? Uh, um, he 
thought uh, he was told. I think he had. He was brought up to think that that, that that's a bad. That's a, that. That's a way to ruin a friendship. I don't think I know. And because, because, because if you loan money to somebody and they don't pay you back, you ruin the friendship. Friendship, yeah. And you ruin the that ruins a friendship because why exactly? Mm -hmm. Why? Yeah, I mean, cool. at the very least, it's a cheap way to find out who the friend is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, why isn't that more important than getting paid back? I mean, Couple that with never lend money you can't afford to lose. Well, that, that yeah, that's that's the that's, the, that's, and that's giving. That's not loaning. I mean, well, every loan is a potential gift, right? That's the real thing. That's the way to I've been neglecting you, though. Uh, we talked a lot about the obligations of the piety of the host. What about the guest? What obligation? What would a pious guest be bound or expected to do? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think, you know, I mean, a guest. It seems to me that just, just speaking, you know, sort of freely and unsystematically, what a guest in this set of hospitality laws is expected to do is tell a story, <laughs> right? In, you know, let people encounter the outside world by finding out who you are. Uh, not seduce and kidnap the wife. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and, and, and uh, reciprocate when and if you have a chance. Yeah. Um, I have a new question. Uh, do the women of the Odyssey experience guest friendship differently than the men? For example, like Penelope or Calico. I forget the name of the princess he encountered. Nausicaa. Yeah, and he washes up on shore. And if it's different, how is it different? Well, I mean, it is different, and the, I think the answer is yes, but I also think that it would take me a whole lecture to do justice the way that it is. Different, and by the end of writing this, I sort of wished I earned that one, to be honest with you. Uh, because, you know, women are in this entirely socially disempowered position, and that means that they exercise social power in a very different way. But it sure as hell doesn't mean they don't exercise it. And, and uh, I mean, Nausicaa says to, to Odysseus on his way into Phaethea, remember, it's my mother you've got to convince. And, you know, Alcan is the king, right? He talks about he, how he's going to de decide to send this guy home. But it's really obvious that everybody's just waiting for the, the queen to make up her mind. Mm -hmm. And it's only when she does that, it, that the whole the tension of the, of the visit relaxes. Um, and, you know, Penelope, you know, I mean, Penelope lived in a place where the older generation had cleared out, and these young men who were growing up were unrestrained and, and potentially violent and wild, and what did she do? She made them all three-year-long guests in her house in order to keep them out of trouble, right. in order to, to uh, hold the peace on the island. And, and uh, you know, the disadvantage of that, of that choice is that there's no way out of it except the way that she picks. But on the other hand, she held it together, right? She, she kept the thing together. She didn't do it the way that Odysseus did it. But she sure as hell did. And he knows it. And he makes it clear that she knows it. And then she says, you know, I know this is never coming back, but here's my thought. I'm going to flood this boat tomorrow morning. And he says, yeah, that's what you should do. So, um, it's, it's a problem, right? Because as I said, the general thing that people do in this book is when they don't want to blame Zeus because it might be impious, they blame women. Um, but but they always do it in Homer in the context of not having a, a, a cluelessness about women and the lives they live and who they are. And one of the things that makes Odysseus interesting as a hero is that the tales he tells about himself, the Phaeacians, which are also the ones who peace to his wife, they're all about women and his encounters with women and the, the women who helped him and the women who, in a sense, educated him. Um, but they, you know they're not they're not ostensible social equals, and it, it's a, it's maddening that they're not in, in the same way that you know Achilles is infuriated because he's not of this station of conventional authority that his natural gifts would suggest. Um, 
I, another way of, of thinking about women's relationship to this is just to look at what Helen does in book four of the Odyssey when Menelaus plays host to Telemachus, and Helen clearly calls the shots and structures the visit. Um, and and to, to the extent that when their ram went on pompously and she's tired of it, she just drugs him to sleep. <laughs> Uh, not right next to you there? Yeah, so. sorry. Oh, um, wait, wait, let me go. There was one other person. No, I was just helping her. Oh, you were? Okay. Yeah. I, I'm curious how, how in control do you think Penelope was? Like, was she just making the best of the situation? And, like, it was a dangerous situation, but luckily nothing got out of hand, or she was in control, or there was like, social pressure, so there was kind of some of the safety, or I don't know. I, yeah, well, I mean, it's not safe, you know. I mean, I think, I mean, obviously, she can, she can be safe at any time. She can call her father and say, you know, take back the bridal gifts and give me to somebody else and put me in a more stable environment as a, as a wife of a new person, right? She doesn't want to do that. She makes it perfectly clear that at the very least she doesn't want to do that because it involves abandoning her son. And she wants to get him to the age where he can inherit the household. Um, one can argue, and one can also argue against the notion that she also hasn't lost faith that her husband's coming back, and that she thinks he's better than these other guys, which he is. Um, but and, and and one of the ways I think you can see that is again in that in that all those in that conversation that they have in book nineteen, when she clearly knows who he is, but there are maids in the room, and so she can't say it out loud. One of the things she tells him is that wild story about the dream she has of all the geese being killed around her fountain by the eagle. And, and she says, now I felt really bad because I was fond of those geese. And he says, yeah, I know, but, uh, you know, the, the prophecy is that the geese got to go. <laughs> and it's not too long after that that she says, you know what, I think I'm going to get that, this bow tomorrow. In other words, it's, a, it's an amazingly complicated conversation that they're having. One of the things she's telling him is that, uh, you know, she, she's kind of fond of these guys, as pathetic as they are, her geese. And, you know, it's, part of her's going to be sad to see them all slaughtered, but, you know, but we've got to move on. Uh, so, you know, I, when you first posed the question, you said, does she, is she in control or is she making the best of a bad situation? I'd say both. Right? She is making the best of a bad situation, but the degree of her control is rather extraordinary, actually. Mm -hmm. And isn't it, it's not for like a day or a week, right? It's no. a long, it's long. It's three or four years, time. yeah. Something like 19 years? Well, it's 19 years, I mean, he's returning home in the 20th year, so by our count, in 20, but, but, uh, but yeah, she's had the suitors in her house for, what, three or four years? It might be longer, it's hard to tell exactly. Um, yeah, but but there there's uh, but I but it seems to me that having him in the house is a perfectly clear solution to to stopping civil war. Right? These are the people who be leading the different factions in the civil war that's going to result because the ruling class is gone and Odysseus is not brought him back. You know, the, this society is in trouble. Right? All those they'd be they'd be the the. the the people who are contending over rule, and she, you know, she's just like Cersei, right? She just gets an eating a lot instead. <laughs> yeah. And they don't, they're clueless about that, right? She's right in front of them, and they do not understand what she's doing, right? Because they're somehow not grown ups, right? They've, all their fathers were taken away, and they've never grown up in a way. And when you get people who haven't grown up, but who are big, and, you know, who are the age of grown ups anyway, man, they're dangerous. You gotta do something with them. Um, I mean, Antinous, when Odysseus, who's the first person shot by Odysseus with the arrow, he doesn't even see it coming because, because it hasn't dawned on him, it still hasn't dawned on him, he's in a dangerous position. So, Odysseus has this pattern of dealing with the challenges of Xenia he faces with dealing with uh, Calypso or um, anyone and best Eumaeus when he comes in. Eumaeus is very, very much by the book, and, and so this just kind of charms him, and he sort of and then he goes and gets him one of the pig, young pigs that he's really supposed to send to the house. Um, 
and and but he and he, when, but when he uh, he lays down the law, when he, he, there's nothing rhetorical about it. It's just action, right? So he so I was wondering if there's uh, if, if there's any if the Odysseus is ever affected by a rhetorical plea anyway from someone seeking a, a, a little, um, yeah, an even from, from what they're likely to get for their bad behavior. Well, there are three people that he could have slaughtered that he doesn't. Okay. You know, one is the other beggar, and he takes pity on him and just gets him out of the room. Uh, and he does that by, by, by hurting him badly enough that he gets dizzy and he, has, he can't punch him and then he drags him out. But he, it specifically says he could have easily killed him. He thought about killing him. He thought, nah, it's a beggar. I should be nice to him. Um, the other two people that he doesn't kill, he doesn't kill because of because asked him not to. He says, no, those are kind of good guys. Right? And he listens to him. And, and he also, you know, when Euryclea first recognizes him, she says, I'll tell you which of the hundred maids or so have been betraying your household. And he says, I don't need to hear that from you. It's like somebody telling you how to drive and you know where you're coming. On the other hand, when it actually comes to that part, he leaves it up to your clear. By then he knows more about her loyalty. So I do think, you know, but, but it is, it's harsh what he does. It's harsh what he does, and you know, there's no question that the guy's harsh, man, and that there's that this new political order is going to be based in this act of slaughter, uh, and that makes it very tricky, especially since it's supposed to be more mild and more democratic than it was before. The notion that it had to be based in this act of slaughter is is, a, is an interesting conundrum, I think. Um, but but he, uh, but I think he. You know, I mean, the, the notion is Athena and he had decided together that they all had to go, and I think they probably did all have to go, right? And, and you just have to pose the question of, of if you left Talon alive, and then, you know, 20 years from now, Telemachus is in charge, what are those 10 going to get up to? Yeah. So there's a way in which it's politically prudent what he does. Certainly what Penelope wants to see happen, and she makes it very clear. <coughs> Uh, I think Julie had a question and James had a question. I have a question, but I want to go after them. These people over here are, are, are where the sun's shining on us, so it's hard uh, to see them. Uh, I already asked mine. Okay. okay. Well, I lost my mind. You uh, said something like um, it's not enough to hear a the story about a person, you also have to sort of have to make it a tale. Can you say more about that? Yeah. I think, I, I, I want to I just parenthetically express my appreciation for what you all are doing with the Interval Program as a, as a beneficiary of the interval program, which I very much am. I want to see it thrive and do the best. And what you guys are doing is that ceremony before the selection made clear is, is engaging in, you know, a kind of bardic account of the, of the history of the program. You accusing us of lying? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not in a position to make that <laughs> I'm only, but I, but I did hear someone threaten a lot. I, I think, uh, and it's perfectly legitimate, right? Because, because it's, it's, it's a necessary thing to do in terms of institutional survival and institutional politics is to have a glorious account, right? And I think, I think the glorious account is well merited, but I think the way you tell that glorious account to you know, bean counters <laughs> is a whole different set of terms than the one you use when you're telling the truth of it to people who experienced it. And, you know, that's just the way work, life works, it seems to me. So, and I certainly everybody here has had some experience, the intensity of which they wanted to convey to someone when they're talking about them. But, and the way you do that is you find yourself exaggerating. Well, there's, there's something real about, about it. That's how speech works, somehow. 
And you hear people better if you know that's what they're doing. You don't you know, like yell upset about it and complain about it, but, but learn to hear it as a, as a sign of significance. Eumaeus invites. Is what? Sorry. You guys want to your throat trying to catch? Yeah, question. I have uh, this question. I'm a bit confused between the piety. Uh, the pious response to a stranger and the pious response to a guest friend. Uh, and I'm wondering if the person who shows up on your doorstep turns out to be a guest friend, do is the pious thing to do different from the pious thing to do if the person who shows up on your doorstep is not a guest friend? And I note that the only example of guest friendship that's been brought into the conversation so far comes from the Iliad. And I'm racking my brain to find an example of guest friendship in the Odyssey. Was that on the one that goes into Malaya? His, his uh, father, uh, maybe that descends, does it? Yeah. Do you inherit? By, by friend, well, yeah, supposedly. Okay. But, it, but by friendship, you mean an, a, 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 a set of mutual recognition and obligation which continues fruitfully into the future. Yes. Over time. So is mental okay, fine. I I'm asking. I haven't forgotten that. I just simply forgotten that I knew it. Uh, <laughs> Menelaus piously welcomes Telemachus. And Eumaeus piously welcomes a baker. Yeah. What's the difference? The commemorative cup. The gift. Yeah. The gift. The contributions. I see what you mean. So the, the one one difference is that Menelaus is welcoming the friend, the, the son of a dear friend, right. whereas Eumaeus is welcoming a stranger. There's a there's a category that Telemachus falls into, which is unknown person, but not quite a stranger. <clears throat> yeah, and the the. the the, the uh, extent of his welcome, and in some sense, in some sense, uh, reflects that. Yeah, that's really that is a difference. And here's why I'm asking that: Does that have any bearing on the question of immigration? I was thinking of France welcoming members of its empire, England welcoming em uh, immigrants from its right. empire. And other countries welcoming people not from empires. Yeah. No, I think mean, you're you're quite right about that. That is a difference, and it's not. You know, I, I tried to have a caveat which got me out of taking that on, but but you're <laughs> you, you're correct. I think that that is a complication, and and uh, I think when you welcome people who aren't distantly related to you, it's scary. But I think the Odyssey balances that with by telling you stories about intra-family murder. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and I think I think at least Homerically, and I like to dwell there for as long as I can get away with it. It's kind of a wash. <laughs> At least, when the, at least in terms of the risk calculation. Might be, it's, it's also easier. Um, it's also the fact, I guess, that guys say that, you know, having brought Telemachus into their house, Menelaus and Helen recognize him. And so, really, to go further with that, you'd have to start thinking about, in my analogy, what's recognition? I'm not, I, I don't think I can make sense of that off the top of my head, I guess. It, could you try reading the Odyssey as 
saying the duties of guest friendship, not the duties, sorry, no place for duty there. The piety one expresses to the stranger at the door should be the same as the piety one expresses to a recognized guest friend. That is, being a human, we are all guest friends. That's the condition of the guest friend. It's not the agreement between your grandparents. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's, or, or in particular, being a human that's, that's helpless and away from home and in need. Um, I think, I mean, that's certainly Kant's argument for the, you know, universal immigration and perpetual peace. I mean, I'm very uncomfortable associating myself with that. Um, <laughs> but, but it, you remind me of it. I, you know, I, I think, uh, yeah, there, there's, I mean, if there's, if somebody that you, that you really care about shows up at your door, you're going to, the way you treat them is going to be an expression of your care. Whereas violations of guest friendship all express the fact that you've forgotten what you are and therefore have forgotten how little you know about who this person is. And that is a real difference. Um, yeah, I, there's more to speak about there. I appreciate that. Yeah. So why does the swineherd take the mantle back at the end of the night? The uh, swineherd lets yeah, go yeah. his borrow a blanket, but then yeah. he doesn't let him keep it. Right. Well, he's poor. He needs it. <laughs> yeah. The necessity is necessity. He's waiting. <laughs> he knows that winter's next month. No, yeah. he's, he's waiting to see if he proves to be a good test. So is that why the permanent gift of the cup is the one that's given to Telemachus, a permanent friend? Well, you can't give things you, can, you can't give things you don't have, right? And and you only got one of those things. Yeah, he says we can't. You know, I can't give you clothes. You know, you're going to have to redon your own clothing. You know, when you go out tomorrow, because we only have one set of clothing each. <laughs> we have nothing to spare for you. Yeah, I mean, as it is, he gives up his own warmth for the night. That's a gift. I mean, Menelaus, I mean, Menelaus is interesting, right? Because part of that interaction shows that Telemachus is not really the same person as his father. I mean, when, when Menelaus says, hey, man, let's take a month long trip around my domains and everybody will give you gifts, take it, you can go home wealthier. Would you like to do that? You know what his father would have said to that. <laughs> <laughs> Telemachus doesn't bother. Yeah. Well, one, one of the things, the difference is between the, the guests is that with the guest friend, a certain amount of risk has already been eliminated. That's simply not yeah, an that's right. That's right. Uh, whereas with the, with, the, with the stranger friend, prudence dictates that you know you, you, you ought to be nice, and you should, but there's something in the back of your mind you don't know this person. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so that's one of the major differences. And sometimes you don't know your friends, but, uh, but but that's one of the major differences. I, I can take a completely different attitude towards a person uh, because I can trust them. Yeah. Well, isn't that also in line with what Mr. Duval asked, which was what is the responsibility of the guest? Now, the, the guest stranger comes in, you don't know who that person is. And you, know, you, you have to develop a a certain level of trust, but that depends on what that person is going to do. Well, yeah, in other words, it, I mean, that's that's certainly that's true, right? The swineherd doesn't know who the hell is. The <laughs> the hell is. Okay. But the audience knows. True. Well, and so you can right? find out by talking, right? But you can't entirely find out by talking. No, but the audience, the, whoever is hearing this or reading this or seeing it perform, they know who it is. So there's a potential in the stranger uh, to be a king. But there's also the potential for him to be a con man. Yeah. 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 Where they ever play poker with a man named Doug. <laughs> 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 
I mean, as you may as makes clear, there's been plenty of commenters telling the same story. I just saw this, yes, I know he's coming back, right? Because they know that's a good way to get the club. Well, I don't think he's got lots of clubs. She can be a pawn. Why should she worry about that? So to the stranger, you're you're good, but you keep your hand on your wallet, as Ernest has said. Because you don't know if they're out to get your money. Sure. Or that's right. That's right. That's right. That's what that's that's the mistake that mental ass made. Um, but you know, I mean, I think well, I think that maybe the easiest place to see the dangers of, of somebody showing up is Odysseus in their fight out of the faking. When it becomes when they know and they make it clear to him after a while that they know that his presence is going to disrupt everything. And the question is whether or not to just kill him or whether to tell him, hey man, you have to marry our daughter and you can never leave. Those would be the safe alternatives. He has to, by telling him stories, he has to convince themselves to join with him in his risky life. Um, and, and uh, you know, I mean, here's a case where the more they get to know him, the more dangerous it obviously becomes. And they decide to be courageous. Um, Brother Kenneth mentioned modern immigration and places where they're taking in, you know, strangers. And, and you mentioned future climate-induced mass immigration. What does it say about places that, you know, go against the Homeric ideal and reject the stranger? You know, build, build walls, trenches, keep them in cages. You know, what does that mean for, for where we are today? Yeah, well, well, I think, I try to, as I try to suggest, there's two ways of looking at that. One is to say they are prudently protective of the necessary conditions of having a secure, homogenous, somewhat homogenous civil life. And the other way of looking at it is to think that they're cowards and that they're failing to face up to the actual demands of the nature of shifting human life and time. And I think everybody's got to answer that one for themselves, actually. And nations have to answer that for themselves. Well, Homer shows the people who do not treat Odysseus the guest well coming to ill ends. And I think that kind of says the same thing about if you don't treat the immigrant the guest well, that you may risk this same bad result in the final outcome in a way that the guest and the immigrant is protected by Zeus. And beware, you'll get your ass kicked back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that would, that would be nice, I guess. I mean, there's... Yeah. It, 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 one of the problems with all these shots we get in, in Homer and what it's like in Hades is that we all come to a bad end. You know? Yeah, the page and ship gets turned to stone yeah. Yeah. on its way back. It's actually, I think the language is actually, it's, it's hard to tell dramatically if the ship gets turned to stone or the ship gets turned to stone and it covers the entire city. Um, it's, it's, it's vague, right? And, you know, I kind of like the fact that it's vague, right? It's like, you know, but like I say, you know, it, yeah, bad things can happen. <coughs> This is a good time to excuse you all, so you've been very patient with me. Thank you so much.